It's Zach Eady with the Purdue men's basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands. I am your host, Joe Jackson. Joining me as always is my guy, Craig Bowers. And today we are joined by special guest, Coach Tonsoni of Delphi Bracketology and also Assembly Call. They do a lot of good work for uh, IU and Bracketology over at Delphi Bracketology, Assembly Call for IU stuff. It is rivalry week. Obviously, tomorrow is the Purdue at Indiana game. Uh, we're going to just kind of do a quick preview, go through some of the key points in that. Uh, Craig, I know you had some some quick facts you, facts you wanted to throw out there, so we'll just go to that right away. Yeah, first of all, I just want to uh, thank you, Brian, for being on the show. Uh, you guys do such great work over there. I, I dipped into the show. It was actually the last time I you lost. Uh, just to listen a little bit as somebody who's who's <laughs> in this craft and in this trade, and and you're a master um, at what you do over Thanks. there. So really glad you could join us today. Yeah, no problem. Looking forward to it. So let's just let's roll through a, a few facts. This is obviously the biggest rivalry. Um, quite frankly, I think it's one of the top five rivalries in all of college basketball. If you're from Indiana, there's no doubt that this is the biggest rivalry, rivalry and most important rivalry in college basketball. I'm having trouble getting that out, Joe. Um, so uh, just going back, the very first game was in 1901. This was a rousing offensive game that Purdue won 20 to 15. Since then, Purdue leads the all-time series, 125 to 92. Um, if we look just more recently, um, Purdue at one point had a nine-game winning stretch. Obviously, in the last four games, IU has won three of those four, and IU has won the last two. We can look at a few other things that are also extremely close. Big Ten championships, Purdue has 25, IU has 22. All-Americans, Purdue has 46, IU has 42. So many things, National Player of the Year, Purdue has two, IU has two. There's a chance that may change this year. And, and Brian, I think that's all the relevant statistics, right? I don't think I left anything big out of there, did I? <laughs> no, no, not really on your show. Uh, but our, our fans that are <laughs> tuning in, because I, I put it out on social media, would, would really be all over me if I didn't ask you about the banners for national championships. Um, oh. We might have the lead in that, in, in that stat, though. And that's how, how many is that? We got five. Okay, okay. So, yes, I guess technically IU does uh, uh, kind of kill us in one spe specific statistic, uh, five national champs to zero national championships. So where do you guys want to jump off from here, Joe? I say for, for our listeners, let's uh, throw it to Tonsoni and just maybe just give a brief um, overview of Indiana's season, maybe for some of our fans that haven't turned into the Hoosiers too much this year. Yeah, the, the Indiana Hoosiers are still a question mark halfway through the uh, college basketball season. They, they had to replace a lot uh, last year in, in two uh, draft picks in Jalen Hood, Shafino, and Trace Jackson Davis. Uh, and then you had some seniors uh, that played a lot of basketball. So uh, Indiana brought in a lot of talent. Uh, they brought in some transfers. They brought in uh, Mackenzie Ambaco, uh, a decommit from Duke. Uh, but they have six new players, and th they have really uh, had a difficult time getting to the level where Coach Woodson wants them to play defensively and offensively. And while the record is not bad, uh, they have been barely beating teams uh, on the roster and playing to the level of opponents so far this year. That Their best game in a loss was to Kansas at home, and they play better at home than they do on the road. So it has been a up-and-down year for the Indiana Hoosiers. Uh, they need a signature win or two to, to get into the discussion for the NCAA tournament. So Indiana fans look at it how they want to look at it. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's a work in progress and everything's okay. Or the, you know, the ship is sinking because it's uh, not where they needs to be. And, and our show sometimes can, can go either way, depending on, on wins and losses. I think they came off their best performance against Minnesota uh, all the way around players, team-wise, doing some things differently. So that was a good sign 
but uh, this team has not played at a at a high level yet this season. Yeah, I'm with you there. I think just it's a they're a weird team in the fact that like their record is good, 12 and 5, 4 and 2 in Big 10 play, but like you said, they just really lack that marquee win. Best win is either home against Ohio State or maybe at Michigan if you if you account for the road. Um yeah, team that had to replace a lot like you said. May, like they're a team that could very well make the tournament. They could also, to me, be a team that ends up with you know eight Big Ten wins if things go sideways pretty quickly. Um, not a ton of depth and a lot of unproven pieces, like you said. Craig, I guess go to you first for as we get into the actual Purdue Indiana matchup. What's like maybe just like one big thing that you're really curious about or going to be looking at for this for this Purdue Indiana game specifically? Well, and, and before I get into that, uh, somebody did put in the chat, actually, Purdue has three national players of the year, if you include John Wooden. So I, I did, uh, I was reading off a statistical page, and that one had it listed as two, but including John Wooden, Purdue does have three there. So potentially yeah. four at the end of the year. I don't know, Zach's kind of in front in that race. Uh, looks like he might have a decent shot at getting it again. In terms of the IU-Purdue matchup, I am actually most interested to see how Purdue tries to defend Malik Renew. Um, I think that's the one matchup for me um, that I'm just really curious how effectively we can guard him. I'm assuming to start the game that that probably means that TKR is on him. I'm assuming that means there's going to be minutes that Mason Gillis has to guard him. Those two guys are very different in terms of their skill set and just their body and their build and how they move around the court. And quite frankly, I've caught a little bit of heat from some IU people on this, but I think Malik Renew is the best weapon that IU has in terms of all the different pieces he has to his game. I know Khalil Ware has had some really big moments, but especially in Big Ten play, and Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like when Ware goes up against a really big physical center, he struggled some. Um, so I think in this game, if IU's going to have a shot at knocking off Purdue, that it's going to be a Malik Renew game. Yeah, Malik is the guy that Indiana goes to in, in crunch time. And, and a lot of times that's with 10 minutes left, 11 minutes left, and all of a sudden they're feeding him and he's able to bring home the, the victory in some of these games where, the, where they've struggled. And, and when he plays his best, I think Indiana is going to be uh, at their best. I think you're spot on there, Craig. Uh, the question is, again, how is Purdue going to guard him? Where you know They like to do the post doubles. Uh, so again, when you asked me last night to be on the show, I was thinking about – you know, uh, how are they going to, you know, they kind of come double. He And Malik Renew has been hitting some threes, too. So you're going to have to guard him out, out on the perimeter. And I think that is an interesting uh, thing to watch tomorrow night is the big shooting threes. Indiana fans have all been up in a roar about Indiana not shooting a lot of threes. And the two times Purdue has gotten beat, teams have been very hot from three. I think Northwestern was at 50%. Uh, and um, Nebraska was 42 62. Was it 62? 62. So, yeah, okay. Um, so the three point shot going away from Edie, but it's interesting with that post double because Indiana likes to play uh, that buddy ball where if you double renew, he's going to throw it up to the rim, and that's where Ware is more effective. Craig, you're absolutely right. Ware is plays hard, which was his problem at Oregon, but he's not physical. And, and when he plays physical Big Ten centers and they throw it to him in the low post, he tries to avoid contact and go up and over and up and around, and he has not been efficient in the post. I personally would like to see him pick and pop. If, if Edie's going to guard him, uh, put him in ball screen action to go against Edie's uh, drop coverage and then pick and pop and, and try to see if Khalil Ware, who has hit some threes this year, can can take that shot. And if, if they do ro rotate, then you got to drive the closeouts. But that I think it's going to be interesting to see how um, Matt Painter goes about that, and he's pretty strong on that post double, so yeah. he's not going to play that uh, that man to man uh, straight up in, in the post. I would the other way though, if they throw it in the post to where I don't know that I would double uh, where, but I know Painter still likes to do that. But we'll see, I, and I do think that's important. Your two point defense is pretty solid. Two point percentage defense is pretty solid. Your defense doesn't get talked about as much. A couple of years ago, that was a struggle with Purdue, but I think defensively, uh, Purdue has done a really nice job. Short of those two games, and again, it took monster games uh, in order to beat uh, beat Purdue. Yeah, I think the three point shot for me is interesting because it's like you said, Renew and Ware both shoot. They're both uh, forty three percent from three, somewhat low volume, and so for me, it's does 
like even though they are shooting well, does Painter make improvements? Right? Is he going to right. just be like, all right, if if Ware's going to hit two, we'll adjust from there maybe. But before that happens, we're just going to leave that pick and pop open. Um, worry about renew down low more, or vice versa. Um, I'm also curious to see kind of going along with that matchup because I think that is one of the main storylines is how this kind of these big rooms match up against each other. Is do we ever do we ever see Edie on renew? And if that happens, does then like you said, Painter loves doubling the post. He probably won't go away from it, but does he trust maybe Edie more one on one against Renew and try to take the passing away then to kind of a dump off to where? Because Renew has been really, really good at that, right? Getting the low post and then um, just pretty much caught what kind of what Purdue does too, where they have that four, that other man dive to the opposite block, get a cut, or just because Ware's so tall and long, just throw it up to him. Um, what are your thoughts? I guess we can go, we can also always hit back on if there's more on big talk because i'm sure there will be with especially with how iu guards the edu but i do want to go to the guard room um there's a comment earlier from jb is there it is will xavier johnson start tomorrow or is he in woods and woodson's doghouse so if maybe if you could comment on that and then also just if he doesn't how you think uh gabe cups and, and brain smith kind of match up well, I have no intel on whether he's starting or not. Um, I, I don't have any. It all goes back to his uh, ejection from the Rutgers game. I, I would assume that that's probably a one-game thing, although uh, he did not play well or he was not as locked in. We'll just say it to be nice to X uh, in the game against Minnesota. So maybe that uh, substitution pattern continues. And I think – I think Indiana, in order to beat Purdue, really needs good Xavier Johnson. Um, whether the question, whether flip a coin, whether that's going to happen, and more so defensively, because Braden Smith has been playing out of this world. I, I don't need to tell you guys that. Uh, I go to Purdue games and watch for Delphi Bracketology. The young man has taken a jump from freshman to sophomore year uh, that Purdue needed, uh, uh, and. And so you got to, if Indiana's got to try to win, we got to try to neutralize him as well as, you know, um, Edie and, and you, the other pieces too, his lawyer. So it's just a well rounded offense, but he really stirs the drink for, for your boilers. And I think Xavier at his best plays without fouling and can pick up Braden and push out the Purdue offense. I, I think the key combining the two questions, fellas, is can you push Edie to five or six feet? and make him shoot the jump hook and hope he misses because he's just an incredible scorer as well. And don't give him easy dunks or don't give him easy drop step to the rims and then push the offense out and guard the three-point line. Um, but in order to do that, you need good ball pressure. Gabe Cups would be the substitute. Gabe Cups does a nice job with ball pressure, but he's not Xavier Johnson yet, if, if at all, with his defensive pressure. Uh, but I don't know that we've seen X at his best. He's been hurt, and when he's come back, he's had two really poor games, and he's gotten, uh, you know, picks up some fouls, and, and mentally he hasn't been as sharp. So that's going to have to happen, uh, I think, for Indiana to really put pressure on, on Smith. I think Cups can do an okay job, but I think Xavier has the potential to do what Indiana needs to do, and I'm not even sure he can do that either the way Braden's playing. But I think that's important. And, guys, I think Indiana needs to take away the three. It's almost to the point where you, you, you let Kaufman run and Edie try to go one-on-one -on -one and score and make it a – Purdue score twos every possession, twos, twos, twos. Because Gillis is shooting 51%, uh, and a lawyer's over 40%, and Smith is over 40%. And then Jones just shoots from – you know, he'll still shoot from Tippy Canoe County when he's in yeah. Bloomington. Um and I just think, you know, you guard the three-point line and take your chances inside uh, is is a recipe that Indiana has used in the past against Purdue and, and, and maybe bet in ball games if they haven't won them. But I just think the guards are, are so, so important. I think the interesting matchup, and I'll send it back to you, is, is that the three spot with Jones on Mbako and Mbako on Jones. Mbako doesn't play really good defense. He struggles. And, but he's been a great scorer recently, and he scored 19 and 14 his last couple games, and he's got a size advantage on Jones. So your thoughts on that matchup as a back end of that, of that perimeter guard matchup I think is going to be key for the game tomorrow night. So you you see Mbako on, on Jones, not lawyer? And Trey, it's and Trey of, it, Garden, lawyer? It, it's, it's, it's one of those two. I, I think <laughs> lawyer – is more dangerous. Like if lawyer goes off for 26 or 27, it's ball game. 
Um, Jones, he can go off too, but he can also miss. He's shooting, what, th- low 30s, mid 30s, something like that? Yeah, like 30, uh, 33, yeah. Yeah, so I love the kid. I mean, um, as much as an Indiana guy can love a Purdue kid, I, I just love his attitude and, 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 and what he's done coming in. And defensively, he is outstanding uh, on, on perimeter defense, I think. But you got to pick your poison. And Mbako struggles. And so Jones is going to get open. If he puts Mbako on lawyer uh, and all those three handoff ball screens and stuff that Purdue runs, the multiple actions, um, Mbako's defensive knowledge um, has been slow to adapt to the college game. So, yeah, it's one of those two, Craig. <laughs> but I think that's yeah. Uh, Go ahead, I mean, Joe. Mr. Obvious comment there. Yeah, I think going on, if it is Lawyer and McBacco, then like I think McBacco has done a little bit better job lately too of attacking the rim or at least getting downhill some. Um, I think early in as he, you know, as a freshman, you adjust, it felt like he very much was settling at times. Also, um, I mean, I tweeted it and and I know that they've ran like a play like this before to get McBacco a three, but it was like a, um, it, it was basically a staggered pin in, right? To get McBacco right. cutting from the paint to the perimeter for three. It feels like IU just doesn't run stuff for him ever either. And I know he is better, more of a standstill guy, but like um, if, if IU doesn't run stuff for McBacco and Purdue can hide, not, I don't want to say hide because McBacco is a very good player on offense. Um, but like get away with lawyer on McBacco and that, and just be like, Hey, close out hard and we'll live with what happens. Um, That'll be big. And then, yeah, the other way is like, can McBacco fight through, like you said, the handoffs, the screens, the all sorts of stuff that Purdue is going to run is also is like any guard to guard stuff. Is IU going to switch that? And then, so is, do we see like, if that happens, does Purdue try to run stuff to get McBacco on Braden and then put Braden in um, or McBacco and pick and roll right with ED up top and, Yep. There's a lot of interesting things that could come from it. I'm excited for. It. I think there could be a pretty good chess match just with all the pieces. You bring you brought up the the three point shooting. You too. think you think lawyer? I didn't think about Purdue's defense. I was always thinking about IU defensively. But lawyer on Mbako does make sense if if you're worried about Galloway. Um, yeah, I and I think a better I think that's where he goes. Yeah, I think, I think so. that's yeah. where he that goes. Makes sense. I think I think Jones guards Galloway. Galloway's a little. Uh, mid-range floater scares me to death after watching yeah, jay yep. Tets like kill us from mid-range and pick and roll last year so i i just feel like because he's got the ball in his hand a lot more and, and is more of an initiator and creator on offense i i think jones starts on him and that quite frankly sense. i think lawyer guards and Baco, and then if he struggles then we see cam heidi come into the game at seven right. minutes or so yeah yep yeah no, i agree i agree there um because what, yeah, what Galloway does, it's different in the sense of Pochettino was just pulling up against Purdue in that drop coverage. But I put out a tweet, I think, once a month of just like, yeah, Trey Galloway doesn't miss floaters. Like, I just I don't see him miss floaters ever. Um, he's going to get yeah. downhill. They're going to run. Last, I know last year they ran it uh, where it was like basically Zoom or Chicago action with it, the, yes. p- the pin down into a handoff. But they'd run it like within the 15-foot mark. And so everything's right. just like there. Um, makes it tough for Edie to kind of contest, especially because the other thing is Galloway's been facilitating the ball well. Like I think that's kind of saved yeah. IU a bit too with what's going on at the point guard spot. Um, just his ability to facilitate, and then he can hit where on, on rolls and things like that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on yeah. more Galloway in, in general for this matchup. Well, yeah, in general, I think he had a great game, uh, Galloway, because he had six assists. And, and I bring that up. I've been talking on our show uh, whether whether a fan likes what Coach Woodson runs, the, the heavy drive and the heavy post-up stuff and heavy middle ball screen, or you don't, whatever Woodson runs, if Indiana just shared the basketball, in the games where they shared the basketball or the moments within games where that ball was moving and popping because they draw defenses, double teams, Indiana is very efficient offensively. Uh, it's when they try to go through three people and, and throw something up or in the post they get double teamed and turn into a, a double team and turn then the turnovers and the shot selection gets to be very, very poor. But Trey Galloway's really good. They run that Chicago tight Chicago where Galloway gets the handoff at the elbow and he turns the corner. And so the interesting thing I think on your guys' behalf is – you know, you've seen Ed play. He's, he almost always plays that drop coverage, and Woodson has really taken advantage of that at Purdue with Hood Shafino, who had the game of his life. But he was just pull up, pull up, pull up. And then Galloway had a pretty good game in Bloomington, 
You also had Trace Jackson Davis in Bloomington who had that that big game. So who's going to have the big game? If Indiana's going to give Purdue trouble, who's going to have that monster game? Is it Renew? Um, Renew's, you know, there were a couple options last year for Indiana. I don't know who the offensive threat is, but I'm looking forward to seeing what they do if they make any adjustments to that uh, their ball screen or the Chicago action, which gave Purdue fits um, in in the two games up there, and and it might be just jumping it and s- jump switching it or doing something to where you're catching those guys uh, earlier uh, in some way and and not letting it be an easy you know easy handoff or easy attack at the elbow. But we don't have a guard that really shoots a pull up, so the Hutchifino option mm-hmm. is is kind of gone right now. Uh, yeah. We don't really yeah. have that option. We have the floater, and we have X getting to the rim. Uh, w- with those ball screens, but we don't really have that Hood Shafino option this year. And it's it's a little bit harder shooting that floater over Zach Eady's size than than most people, and it's a little bit harder getting to the rim uh, with the way that Zach's been protecting the rim this year. There's a lot of national analysts that it not only think Zach wins National Player of the Year, but think he's top five for National Defensive Player of the Year, which is the way he's affected games at the rim this year, also. So. I, I think that'll be interesting all the way around. And and I'm, I'm still on the, I think it's got to be re, a renew game for IU to, to, but we've seen time and time again, like in these rivalry games, right. Where it's somebody that you completely don't expect. Like um, right. shoot. What was the kid from uh, the Lafayette area that torched us Fantasy. a couple of years ago? Fantasy. Fantasy. Yeah. Nobody saw that coming. Um, nobody saw Matt Harms having a game a couple of years ago. Like, you never know in these rival rivalry games. Um, it just keeps on sneaking up in terms of somebody popping off out of nowhere. IU has seemingly shot the three better in, in this last four, five, six game stretch, but still not necessarily putting up a ton of them. When I was listening to your show the other night, I thought you said something really interesting in terms of why they don't shoot more. You you said something about their three point shooters with their toes to the basket. Can you just explain a little bit what you mean by that? <laughs> Um, 10 toe shooters. Um, I, okay, that's I, I, need what it to was. Gi- I need to give credit to someone. Um, I forget who gave that to me, a coach around here. Um, someone talked to me about that. 10 toe shooters are basically kick out shooters, uh, where your 10 toes have to be aligned in order to make the shot. You're not going to come off a screen and heel toe toe or, or hop or whatever the preferred method is of catching off the move. So Indiana has not had or not developed uh, off-the-move shooters. So in other words, it's always got to be when defensive have doubled the post or you draw a a help side and kick out against the help side for for those shooters. So that's – and that's Mike Woodson's philosophy is to always play – try to get an advantage and try to get – draw two defenders. It's either going to be through the ball screen. It's going to be through uh, a a post-double. Uh, and then play out of that. And so Indiana shooters, X is that way. Uh, Gabe Cups is not a, a huge offensive threat at the moment. He's more of a facilitator and then a pest on defense. Uh, Trey Galloway is a 10-toe shooter uh, other than his catching and drives. And so they have to have um, assists, you know, drive the lane and assist, uh, and they're not going to come off the screen. And Baco's probably the best – off the screen shooter and he his hips are a little still a little tight i think um for 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 shootings so that's what i meant by that and that's where i say indiana's better when they drive to pass as opposed to drive with their head down and bully through people and and score almost everyone walker banks the guys off the bench i don't know if they're trying to prove something or whatever but they drive in and i've even tracked it When, when they shoot in traffic the ball most of the time doesn't go in, and then they miss opportunities to kick out. And it's just been frustrating on Indiana's end. Um, but the few times that they've had good games doing that. So that's what I meant by the the 10-toe toe, toe shooters. We, okay. we have to be, yeah. be set. And the problem, Craig, has been Indiana shooters have not been ready either. Uh, I would have them down and ready on every type of thing, but they're a lot of standing and watching one-on-one basketball and then reacting as the ball's coming to them, uh, when they're ready to shoot the basketball, have their feet ready, uh, you got to have good shot preparation in the game. And I don't think Indiana has good shot preparation. It's getting better. It's getting better, but it, it's nowhere near where it needs to be to consistently hit down, hit threes. Right. 
so far we've kind of talked about how does Purdue match up with IU? What does Purdue do against this or, or that for IU? I guess from your side, what's the matchup that scares you that Purdue presents as an issue for, for IU to handle? I, you got to start with the big fella, um, you know, <laughs> and that's a Mike Woodson term. So I just threw that out there. Uh, big fella. He'll, he'll, he'll be saying that in, in the preview and the post game. Uh, he's just uh, been a fantastic college basketball player. And guys, when I was at Mackey last and, and looked at his body, he has really worked on his body. It, it, it now looks like an NBA body instead of just a, a big kid who's athletic and playing good basketball. It now looks like he's really toned up his legs, his arms. And I think he's moving better from the few games that I've watched that, that he's moving better. That might be part of the reason defensively uh, he's always been good, but I just think his body – is, is good. And it's, it's just so hard because he does so many good things and he's so dominant. If you double him, you're going to give up threes. If you let him alone, he's going to score, uh, an incredible amount of points. So I think you got to be physical. I think this is a Peyton Sparks game who doesn't play a lot coming off the bench, a six, nine kid from ball state. I, I think he's going to go in and try to be physical, uh, with Edie. At least I would do that. I think the key is not letting Edie get good position. Catch him on his rolls. Uh, when he does post up, try to get a knee in his backside and push him off the block. So when he does go, um, he's got to shoot a little bit further out. He's got that nice baby hook, but you hope he misses. And, and then I would lock in on three-point shooters. I would not let Braden, I, Braden Smith scores 20. He's going to have to get to the rim. And he does that really good too, but he's not shooting the three. Um, and, and Mason Gillis isn't shooting the three. Uh, I would take the threes away, and if Edie scores 50 and you got to hope to win 75 to 74 and Edie has 50, I, I just think the three-point shot is such a big part of the basketball game um, that I love having Renew score down low for us, and I'm sure you guys love Edie uh, down low for you, but what really makes the, the wins, as we've said, Northwestern and, Wisconsin, and Nebraska won by having an incredible day at three, and it's been a big contention a lot with our fans, too, is just the lack of institutional desire to shoot the three. It's college basketball. It's at the rim, and it's the three. So I would give Purdue the rim, and then I would take away, take away the three. And then the other thing is ball pressure. Uh, Galloway does a good job blowing up screens. And when the reason, probably more so than Hood Shafino, is uh, the guards last year struggled – in the atmosphere at Purdue, I don't think that's going to be quite the issue this year because I think those guys are a lot seasoned. But if you can make the guards pass the ball f to the post from five feet out, pick them up at half court, and really get into them, and then the key fellas is fouling. Purdue can't foul. The team that fouls the most, I know it's the, the house of calls and all of that stuff, but, um, you know, so I hope that uh, we paid these guys a little bit extra to come in tomorrow night. <laughs> But fouling is, is going to be important, especially on the perimeter and then who's in foul trouble, who's, who's not in, in, in foul trouble. But I, I just think it, it's a multi-headed monster that you guys have. That's why you're the best team in the country. But you got to pick your poison. And, I, and I'm going to take Smith away as much as possible and try to frustrate him. And I'm not going to let Lawyer um, and those guys. So I, to me, the key is Jones and Kaufman Wren. I mean, Coffin Wren, last time I saw him, got 22 or something in person. His game is just um, – I, I, I don't know if I told you I had the luxury of, of going to a couple of his summer workouts when he was working with his trainer, um, hmm. Jordan Del, uh, Delks out of Rossville, and my son. My son works for him in the off season, so they invited me to watch. Great dude. Just a great young man. And his game has just really exploded. So, you know, you got five starters out there. You're going to put one, two, and three emphasis on the on the two guards and Edie, and now you got a guy like uh, Trey Kaufman and, and then and a guy like Jones who, can, like I said, can shoot it from Indianapolis when he's in Assembly Hall. It, it's tough, but I would make those guys beat, beat IU in that loud, raucous atmosphere and force the guys who are somewhat new to the rotation to have to go into that hostile environment and play good – good games and I think another key for you guys is Mason Gillis he didn't play well last year um there and, and you know he's kind of that that six-man energy guy shooting a three and a hustle guy he's got to play better uh I think for you guys at, at IU as a as a veteran player of of this rivalry but yeah that's what I would do um I would play Edie as tough as possible 
if you double Edie, there's two ways. You go on the pass and attack his hands and try to get the turnover out of his hands before he even gets settled. Or you take away his kickouts, and once he starts bouncing it, you dive in real hard on a dribble. Uh, those are the two ways you double, but he's so big. If he can get that ball in a pass and he passes out, it, it's, it's just really dangerous. I don't know that I would double him. That sounds really stupid, and that's probably why I'm a former head coach in high school. Um, you know <laughs> – <laughs> but um, you got you got to pick your poison, and if you double Edie and hold him to fifteen, the other guys are going to get twenty and twenty five, and 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 the, and that'll solve some of that, you know, pressure of being in Assembly Hall. So uh, the other the other thought would be to let them shoot from outside in that atmosphere. But I just I've seen too much of of, of Purdue basketball the last two years. I think they're ready for for this kind of thing. So you really got to be sharp with with who you want to take away, and then stick with it and live with it. Yeah, so lots lots of good points in there. Um, I think one thing I mentioned on our what was it the Penn State post game show we did just like a very very short IU preview is like obviously Assembly Hall at Purdue or when Purdue comes like there might not be a better atmosphere in the entire country and no matter how many times you go through that that's still going to affect you in some way. But this year the only two rotation players or three if you count Colvin there's only three players that have not gone through this right everybody else returns last year so that's Jones Heidi and Miles Colvin so a freshman a redshirt freshman and then Lance Jones if there was a guy to not care about an atmosphere I would pick Lance Jones just based on, on kind of how <laughs> he is as a dude like I don't I don't think that'll affect him um I want to I want to touch back on the three point shooting for Purdue specifically because you kind of mentioned like you have you have two options it's you double Edie and you live with the shots or you take away the threes um, and then you make Edie go to work down low MSU tried the the latter there with Edie going to work last year but and he had like what was it thirty nine or something like that um, yeah where is a much better defender than anything MSU has at the center spot. Indiana this year, they are I'm looking at Ken Palm. They're 314th in defensive three point attempt rates. So basically, what that means is they give up a lot of threes. And a lot of that, I think you saw a lot of these mid major games that they played was you would just see Renew or Walker or whoever else on kind of at the wing forward spot. They would just be flying around on defense, always like just trying to be in rotation. Um, teams would space them out and then just get up a bunch of threes. When TKR is in, he's going to have one or two open threes, I assume. He'll take them and um, I assume I use just going to kind of live with it. If they go in, they go in. But when you, you, you mentioned Mason Gillis and how he has to play better. Do you assume that like, if Gillis is in, will we see more of just only one of renew or where on the floor that all at that point, um, is it going to be renew at the four and just trying to, you know, you kind of live with what you can with what he can do on the perimeter. Do you see more? I mean, Anthony Walker is a guy who at least moves well on the perimeter, um, what what are your kind of your thoughts, especially when Gillis is in, knowing that that's a way that Purdue, or teams have kind of taken advantage and from taken advantage of Indiana early on this year? Yeah, I think Renew will will stick with them. Re Renew's been okay defensively um, at the four, uh, but that does create a new type of spacing for uh, that that Indiana's face. You brought up a key thing. Uh, we're all clamoring for Indiana to play three guards. Uh, and there's been a little more of that the last couple of games uh, when you, you would have Cups X uh, and Galloway or uh, X um, Galloway and CJ Gunn. I think that kind of lineup matches up more to the Purdue rotation. Um, Walker is a very athletic guy. Um, and, and so I think that would be a good fit. But, you know, you need Indiana needs where. The stats for wear and renew out there, the plus numbers are out of this world. So I don't know that that's just going to be an automatic Gillis comes in at the 15-minute mark or the 14-minute mark, and you're going to take a renew out for Walker. And, and Woodson's pretty straight on who comes in for who for the most part. He, he, he's changed that up a, a little bit. Um, but, but the reason Indiana's given up a lot of three is they play this NBA-style defense nail slot rim where they put people all away and help Joe – uh, not not like halfway. Most defenses play gap, right? And and you're between that flat triangle. And then if the dribbler comes and it's dangerous, then you go to help and then you recover. But they just go to help. They go to help before the action even starts. And so then what teams do is when they drive, the help just stays automatically and they're very slow getting out and the backside rotations have been. Now, they've started staying closer to shooters the last few games. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a change that um, – 
always is made about this time every year after a half of a season. Penn State hit IU for like 38 threes or something. That's a made-up number because it really ticks me off. Felt um, like it. But um, – it felt like it, and they got beat. They got run out of the gym in, in Happy Valley, and then all of a sudden, you started. They started playing a little closer to shooters. So watch for that tomorrow. If they're really in help to guard that ball screen to stop penetration from Smith, and they think that, then all of a sudden, your lawyers and your Jones are going to get easy kick out threes, even with the backside rotation if it's there and sharp. Um, that's the reason because it, in the NBA they want that shot, and and they you know that. They would because great things happen in the lane in the NBA all the time and not so much in college. And that's just been a point of contention for me personally. But that's why Indiana's given up a boatload of threes because it's just been dribble to the top of the key, kick out to the wing, shoot the three. If they do that against Purdue, you guys will be having a great post game show and I'll be driving home <laughs> in misery. Um, I think you just got to stay tight to these guys. And I think Indiana has, to Woodson's credit, if I remember the IU the game at Bloomington, they were really tight coming off that the the hand off the pin down mm -hmm. with yes. the hand off up top. That they were chasing it hard and trying to blow up that stuff. So I think he's made the adjustments against Purdue, uh, and he has to. Um, but that's mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why the strategy's been to give up those threes, and they've been they've paid for it most of the year. Well, there, there will be no number one team coming to Bloomington. Uh, they did release the AP poll, and UConn has moved in front of Purdue. I think they got about 16 votes more. Let me see. They got 19 more first-place votes and 36 more regular votes. So UConn is now number one. Purdue is number two. Um, don't know that that takes anything away from the game, but that number one usually means something to the opposing teams if they win anyway in that type of environment. And um, of course, there's been some was when IU beat Kentucky, Kentucky was number one, right? On that famous yes. Watford shot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I obviously been some special moments uh in that building for that team. I I really question I know you said you have to start with the big man. Um for for whatever back and forth there's been with Purdue fans last year between Tra Trace Jackson Davis and and Zach Eady and who was better and who was National Player of the Year, they were probably number one and number two best players in the country last year. And Trace Jas Jackson Davis was elite defensively and an elite athlete with a man's body. Um, I really think this has a chance to be a big big Zach Eady game and Braden working off a high ball screen pick and roll. And Zach rolling to the rim, Zach setting up early and getting position. I think there's a chance that he can get wear and foul trouble pretty quick. And then I'm real curious if Sparks comes in at six foot nine and tries to guard him. Um, I there's a lot of games I go into and look for little things here and there, but I think this game just simply has a chance to be a huge Zach game. I kind of want it to be, Craig. Let him get 45. <laughs> let him let him get Player of the Year. Hey, and Smith, Smith did, gets five and. You know, yeah. Um, when when that, when Tom Izzo did that, it didn't work out. Well, how many times it has it worked did. out? You guys have only lost five games in what two years? <laughs> like you're asking me, what? How do you beat a team that? By the way, they're still number one in Delphi bracketology. That really there matters, yes. right? The AP, you can just send that AP. Yeah. So you can tell your your listeners to tune into Delphi bracketology, and uh, we'll, we'll set the record straight. The wins that Purdue has is far outnumber what what you can UConn. We do have UConn at, at number two, um, mm -hmm. but for what that's worth, I yeah you, you just have as a coach when you have a team with this many weapons, you just have to pick your poison, and then if your poison beats you, tip your hat and say you know we're we're going to the next game at Wisconsin. There there is no easy way to guard Purdue in my opinion. Um, it, it you know and, and it could very well work if you double team and you keep Edie below uh and, and the atmosphere rattles some guys and and it's hard to shoot some people said it's hard to shoot in, in assembly hall i don't know what the percentages were last year um what Purdue shot Thank from Paul. three last year um uh, purdue that, I, at at assembly hall they were six for 18 33 percent so, so whatever close not not and horrible then, at Mackey, they were five for 23, 21 percent. Right. That so you know, Gill Gillis's numbers are up this year. I think Smith is yeah. much more confident and more aggressive this year about seeking out that three. 
And then you throw in that, you know, TKR is shooting 44% this year on basically one attempt a game. Cam Heidi's shooting, is he, he's 55%. Um, yep. I, I, I've got this running bit, Brian, that like there's a requisite one Cam Heidi three every single game uh, because he would hit one. And a lot of times it was one of one. Um, and you just got some took, hops. Yeah, yeah, he, he took three hops now. He took three last game and hit two out of three. So I think he's getting a little more comfortable, especially as he starts to get a few more minutes. So I, I, I mean, maybe they shoot 33% again, but I just think it's a more confident team uh, that's going to step into those shots in that environment, uh, just with a little more swagger about it this year. I'm really curious too. You, we've talked about Mbako on D, whether he guards lawyer, whether he guards Jones, I'm curious if Purdue can kind of run him off the court. Um, just like if they can put him in enough action, because they'll they'll run stuff for both of those guys depending on the lineup that's out there. And if if he can't guard, you know, to me that's if we look at like how are you going to assert your will or your style or what you want to do as a team, I think whoever wins that matchup could be kind of interesting too. Because if if one of those guards is just running him all over the court, he can't keep up defensively, then that may force IU to go to that three guard lineup, and vice versa. And he doesn't really post up much though, or. Does he? I mean, he's got that he, well, size, but does he does he use it? The, here's the question: You got uh, you got a five and a four who need to be in the lane. Where he, you right. know he can. A lot of people thought he was a better four coming in. A lot a lot of the recruiting analysts thought that he was better to play a four. Uh, but they have put him. He's driven the ball well. They've put him in ball screens now to get into the lane, which I think is going to be um, Colby, for, former student of mine. Uh, with that comment on, on the YouTube. Thanks, Colby. Uh, so, uh, you know, read, I do read think it that for, matchup... Read it, read it for our uh, spot, Spotify and Apple listeners. Yeah, Colby Kinsey says, Delphi Bracketology rankings greater than the AP poll. Simple facts. Um, appreciate that, my friend. But I think that three spot, uh, you know, you guys said lawyer, garden, and uh, I think Indiana needs Mbaco to get 20 uh, yeah. and, and put pressure on lawyer because the same thing. If all of a sudden you need a better defender, now lawyer, the offensive threat is out. Um, you know, so I, I think that's going to be if you, if you if Mbako struggles. So I, that to me, I, and I say it, the the studs are going to be studs. Renew, Edie, Smith, and and you want to try to limit them or take away what they do. But the three and the four. So where, um, and Kaufman, Wren, and then lawyer Jones, Mbako, Galloway, those those three might be the difference of where the where the game is and and right now those players for Purdue have played a little more consistently than the Indiana players but at home Indiana's played a lot better and I think um, that that's that's the key unless someone just goes off like Trace Jackson Davis or whoever one person uh, matchup but I, I think it's going to come from those those two spots at least the three and the four and maybe uh, Galloway needs to have a special night. Um, to put pressure on your good offensive players, um, you know yeah, who, who wow. wins that stylistic matchup? Yeah, yeah, yep. And then I think we've caught. I think we've kind of circled this topic, but like the bench depth, right? Uh, IU is their CJ Gun starting to play a little bit better, starting to be a little more trusted, uh, shoot the ball a little bit better. Anthony Walker seems to be consistently kind of that backup four spy um and then they kind of alternate between wear and renew with him are you cons obviously I, I assume the answer is probably going to be yes i assume but are you concerned at all that purdue is just going to be able to cycle through more players right you mentioned if lawyer like if lawyer does get played off the floor let's say with Pigbaco, purdue has you know either ethan Moore or camden heidi who are both much much better defensively that they can bring in with size um are, is that is that a concern at all that it's just Purdue might just have more dudes at, at the end? Yeah, because our bench has been up and down, uh, and, and I, I I haven't followed Purdue. I know I go there with Delphi Bracketology, but you know Morton has started a lot of games. He's coming off the bench. Uh, the Heidi kid it looks like he can contribute, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe those backup guys, whoever has you know, uh, Craig. I think you said it. Sometimes out of nowhere, someone comes in and makes a big impact. But but the Indiana bench has been up and down. Walker's probably been more consistent uh, with scoring and rebounding. 
uh, of the guys coming off the bench. And it'd be interesting, go back to the very first question, is X comes off the bench and Cup starts, that could be an interesting uh, dynamic about when he comes in and how many minutes and who they match up uh, against at some time. If he comes in, when you're given one of your two ball handlers the rest, I know um, Painter likes to have one of the two guys out there at, at all times. And um, So, uh, yeah, I think Purdue right now wins the bench uh, from what has happened previously. Yeah, uh, But Indiana, both Walker and Gunn uh, have shown – that they are capable of having double-digit games in, in their own style. Gun th- shooting would help. Walker slashing uh, could help uh, if he's at the four uh, against first or Gillis or some of those guys. So I think Indiana's bench is capable and could be dangerous uh, as long as you don't see the five subs or the four subs that Woodson does all the time. If you guys do, then you'll see a 10-0 run to either get you back in the game uh, and take IU momentum or extend the lead. Woodson's been known to play all his subs at one time instead of trying to keep. I think you got to have Trey and X, one of those guys out there at, one, at, at a time, and you got to have one of the two bigs out there all the time uh, for Indiana if they're going to even uh, be remotely close to competing and winning um, yeah. Tuesday night. So I think one last question, then we'll kind of start wrapping this up. Uh, one thing we've highlighted on the show pretty consistently throughout the year is the best way to at least try to slow Braden Smith down is a hard hedge. Like it's the one way Purdue doesn't really have the options. They don't really have the players to be able to throw it ahead and attack off of it and try to hit ED that way. Um, so a hard hedge force brains to just have to retreat. Uh, he did a little bit better against Penn state. I think of drawing it out more. Obviously Penn state's not, uh, not at the top of the conference. We'll say, do you see where, from what I've watched and we're calling, he's mainly been a drop big or maybe at the level. Um, do you see them throwing a hedge or anything like that out there just to try to throw Brain Smith's passing out? Or you think they stick with, hey, I know it also, it goes back to, do you want to take away Edie or the three probably? But um, do you think they, they have that in them if they want it? And if so, who's it going to be that's going to be kind of uh, showing that coverage? I think Indiana is going to stick with what they've done. They're going to go over the top of that ball screen. They're going to drop um, the big and try to catch Edie on the backside. Um, I don't think that's horrible uh, because you can't go under because the kid will hit a three. Um, You know, and 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 if Indiana hasn't hedged, I think they've jumped out maybe once or twice or whatever. I just can't recall when they've done that. It's not in their it's not in their game plan. That's why they play that nail slot rim. They catch that perimeter guy. so I don't think that's, you know, I would love to see it. If I'm coaching against Purdue, I think you got to try to disrupt your point guard and, and a hard hedge or a trap. Uh, yes, it creates rotations, but then, you know, make a couple passes and hope Purdue throws it, you know, um, out of bounds or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to probably see that more, guys, um, to really try to get the ball out of his hands and then recover uh, to the big fella and so forth. But I don't think Indiana will do that. I think they're going to live and die with trying to make sure Braden has a tough time coming off the screen, getting into him, uh, and beating him to the screen. I, and I think that they're going to uh, play drop coverage. The question is, do they help off uh, if he gets free from the wing and then they do backside rotations, or do they stick to shooters and then let you know Braden shoot that two and that, that layup, which he's really good at, um, but again, I'm hoping for a bunch of field goals from twos, uh, yeah. beat us, per, beat us from two Purdue, uh, don't beat us, um, with, with the three, but that's kind of my overall philosophy of, if I were going to go back and, and coach, uh, take away the rim and, and the three, not and mid range shots. Sometimes they beat you. Sometimes they don't. I just think Purdue has a lot, a lot of weapons. And so what's the easiest to take away guys, your three point shooting by staying close. Edie's mm-hmm. hard to take away. Smith at the lay, layup, and that's hard to take away. But what we can take away, and maybe that's just enough um, if Indiana can find some offense to, to win a game. And, and I think that can happen. So, I, you know, I'm looking forward to a, a, a good game. But I think Indiana has to play really, really solid. We haven't talked about rebounding. Purdue's really hurt IU rebounding, and Indiana's a bad rebounding team right now. Uh, Indiana mm-hmm. is in the wins was, was able to withstand – the bad offensive or the bad defensive rebound because he had offensive performances out of this world from Trace Jackson Davis and Hood Shafino. With this roster, Indiana's got to do a much better job of cleaning up uh, your misses if they're going to win. And that, that's the recipe. Um, 
twos, not threes, and rebound, and don't turn the ball over. Indiana has a shot to win this game. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, two of the things I point out at the beginning of every postgame show is what was our rebounding margin and what was our free throw margin because – if Purdue wins the rebound margin big, and if they win the free throw margin big, uh, chances are Purdue won the game at the end of the day. There's very few times when that spread's significant uh, where Purdue doesn't go ahead and get a W. As we go to wrap this up here. You're not getting any um, calls, though, Craig. I I'm going to make sure. I like you guys, and you're, you're good people. I, I like having beers with you, and you do a great <laughs> job on this show. That's why I agreed to come on. But I'm going to be down there early trying to find those officials uh, and, and <laughs> well, make sure that maybe you, maybe you get the rebounding. But, you know, it's – a you know, the house of calls, hey, man. We, we, we need it. We need it. There's there's a lot of fans that are going to be uh, looking to see if they can map Courtney Green's travel path after the game today that he calls in Michigan versus Ohio yeah. State to see whether he's going to be an IU or not. But um, it, it'll be interesting. But it, as we go to wrap this up, let, let's just look back a little bit. And first of all, those of you guys, uh, we got a really, really good audience for uh, last minute, middle of the day. Yeah. Um, we... Coach Tonsoni wasn't going to be able to come on because he was supposed to be teaching today and then school got canceled. So we were able to throw this together last minute. If you're in here, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, hit the like button for us. There's been over 140 people listening live, uh, which means those numbers are generally much, much bigger later on. Uh, we want you to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. It gets more people here um, listening and tuning into the show. But as, as we look back and, and those of you in the comments, go ahead and throw your favorite moment in here as well from past Purdue IU games. So I'm going to throw it to you. I actually, I'm going to, I'm going to give my favorite moment first. Um, th this was like, I don't know, probably around the time that Joe was born. Uh, no, probably three or four years before Joe was born. But I, I grew up in Centerville, Indiana. And for those of you guys that don't know where Centerville, Indiana is, it's right on the Ohio, Indiana line, basically on interstate 70. It's the last city that you get to before Richmond. Richmond's the last city that you get to before you cross the line. My dad was a Indiana Track and Field Hall of Fame track coach and cross country coach at Richmond High School for a really long time. Then he was an assistant administrator. So I grew up watching Richmond basketball a lot along with my home high school, Centerville High School. So I watched Woody Austin come up through high school. I watched Chad Austin come up through high school. And then to watch Chad go to Purdue. And in 1996, he hits a three pointer with like 13 seconds left that goes ahead and gives Purdue a two point advantage. And Purdue wins that game. And then to turn right back around in 1997 in an overtime game and sink a, a baseline shot with 0.6 seconds left, a really tough jump shot to win that game. Uh, that That's my favorite personal moment. I, there's a lot of others, and there's some coming through here in the chat right now that are also some of my more recent favorites. Uh, but just that whole connection of me watching going through and, and growing up and my dad having taught at that school and everything else. Um, my brother... My, bre my brother famously scored two points over Woody Austin in a seventh grade junior high basketball game that he always brings up. Um, that, that whole connection just makes that a little bit closer to me, and I, I love that moment from Chad Austin. So, Coach, what's what's one of your favorite IU-Purdue moments? I'm assuming it's an IU win. Well, I, I'm going to go away from the games. I need to prepare to go back. There's, You know, when you've watched so many, there, there are just so many good memories even in, in some of the tough losses. Um, so I, I probably need to do some research to remember, but I'm going to, I'm going to share a, a couple. Um, the, the darn, uh, uh, coach Knight show where he had a guest, uh, appearance. You could watch it on YouTube. Um, that was ridiculous. And that speaks to the rivalry where, where he brought a donkey on the show, um, <laughs> is a memory of mine, but more so when I was in college, uh, my high school teammate uh, was playing baseball for Purdue and he was a roommate with Everett Stevens. And so I come up for a weekend and as soon as I walk in, I'm hearing boiler up and all this stuff coming from Everett's room. He was just uh, giving me, giving me the business. And then um, we proceeded to go out uh, and have a really good time on campus. Uh, and Everett Stevens, uh, the basketball player got us into every, every frat and every party uh, in, in town that weekend. So, you know, as much as I want to beat you guys and, and the rivalry and, and it's real, uh, you guys do good things. And uh, there, there are a few uh, a few people that I can hang out with that uh, that do those. But those were a couple couple of memories that were outside of wins and losses of the rivalry that I, I do remember. I, I can't. It was 87, 88. I think it was 87. Indiana won. And. I, I'm at the exit there by the McDonald's, uh, 17th Street, uh, not 17th Street, but the bypass, and I'm 
we're banging drums and everything and shouting at everyone. Um, so this rivalry means a lot. I know the Purdue fans in the chat, I appreciate you guys being patient with me uh, with a, a rival invading your show. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's good. There's no one that we want to beat more than you guys, and, and I'm sure that's vice versa. Yeah, and I think I think there's a lot of, uh, at times, just stupid talk on Twitter of, like, rival, this game doesn't mean as much. Like, this is when the, the, when the calendar comes out, IU circles Purdue, Purdue circles IU. Like, it just is what it is, and, and it's how it should be. Um, for me, like, I'm mu a much newer fan in this rivalry. Uh, then you two, my first year at Purdue was really the first year I became a fan, and that was the 2018-19 season. Um, so a couple for me, the the one singular moment, and Matthew Graber actually shared it here in the chat too. He was at, he said I was at the game in Mackey in 2020, and Eric Hunter dunked to close the first half. It was epic. It was a tough year for Purdue, but that was a fun moment in the rivalry. The singular moment for me is that um, you get No Gel Eastern picking up full court with like. 20 seconds left shot clocks off pokes one free Eric Hunter throws it down like right before the buzzer and it was one of those moments it's only happened a few times where it's gotten to like this level where um, the only way I can describe it is the noise level in Mackey like usually even when it's at its peak and it's insanely loud you can like pick up where sounds are coming from like they're still distinguished uh, that was one of the few moments where it was just legitimately just a thunder everywhere and like everything just blended it was it was absolutely the like the loudest I've heard Mackie. Um, so that was fun. My very first game was that in this rivalry was the Romeo Langford game. So just seeing him be the, the five star. And I know he had like the hurt hand and all that stuff, but come in and I think he had more turnovers than made shots or something like that. Um, that one is up there for me as well. Uh, Craig, do we want to kind of just throw a couple of these up on the screen or? Yeah, for sure. And, and I probably the most popular one by far that's in here. So we must have some relatively younger listeners um, is the John Octius baptized in the masses. And I think some of these moments, the Eric Hunter dunk, the Octius dunk, when they come from not the stars that are on the court, also like make it a little bit more special. And uh, that that Octius moment and the call, the call makes like it was an awesome dunk. But the call that goes along with that dunk was that Gus? They made that call. I think so. Yeah, I, I would um, think so. Yeah, uh, made that special. Um, let's see. Like you oh, said, the Todd Matthew Foster said the dancing air. on the Todd Foster won a game in Bloomington was dancing on the scorers table or something like that. I believe. I don't I believe personally that was, remember that. But what years did Foster I, play? Oh, I couldn't tell you. I'm I'm bad. My memory is starting to was fade away. Yeah. Todd, Todd Foster. Foster. I, I can't think. remember exactly. What 87, though. I was a sophomore down there. Indian, each team won at home, and I think they both teams were in the top ten uh, in in 87. So mm -hmm. those were mm -hmm. those were really good matchups in 87. That's back back a, a few for you young viewers. <laughs> We've also got a Cornell game winner, and obviously the the more recent, uh, really recent Harms tip in again. That was a Harm. gross game. Yeah, that was it was a gross, gross game. Gross. 48 to Matt 46. Harms. All right, Matt Harms not the star, but he has that last that last moment there. I've got I got well, somebody else who IU fans were were not the nicest to him that game either. Obviously that's how it goes for both <laughs> fan bases, but specifically that one, you could hear it on the broadcast right. and then he has the game winner. We've got the chair throw. Uh, Jeremy Hunter says the chair throw was the best moment in the Purdue IU rival rivalry. I'm struggling with that word today, Joe. <laughs> um, Todd Foster, 91 to 94. So that I guess I would have been in high school. Uh, I must have missed that um, moment of him dancing around. I guess so. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So yeah, those are the main ones that have come up. Uh, nothing else outside of that. I'm surprised nobody said that Carson Edwards. I'm not playing moment. Oh, um, yeah. as a big Carson Edwards guy, I know some people Look, didn't like the kind of throat slash, hey. but like I was the car, I was a huge Carson Edwards is probably my favorite player, him and Etwan Moore of all time for Purdue. So that, that was a big moment for me too. For all these young viewers out there, Purdue won what, like eight years in a row. Uh, they had, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of memories, you know, and it's just getting back into this rivalry here, <laughs> you know? That's True. the other thing I'm afraid of. Like mm -hmm. it's it's three out of four, 
And, mm. you know, Painter's, Painter's going to make sure that these guys are, are ready uh, tomorrow night because uh, nothing would be better than winning in Bloomington. But, uh, yeah, it, it was it, – the rivalry is best when it's going back and forth. And, and I know we each want to win two games every year, but it is better when it's a little more balanced. And you guys have had your way uh, uh, with uh, Indiana for, for quite a while. And so we're hoping to – more fantasy shots. There, there's some of you for there, you young bloods yeah. in, the, in the comments. That was a recent shot, yeah. recent great game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, there's not, there's not enough of your uh, assembly call fans in here in the chat providing IU moments. So I, I gave the opportunity to everybody. It was just not, not quite enough of them in there dropping some IU moments. So that's all right. Totally understand. Yeah. All right. Do well, you, we're, uh, we're in an hour, Joe. I think yeah. we're that we went longer than we dreamed we would. So <laughs> you ready to wrap up? Well, we do every time but yeah uh no we appreciate everybody tuning in uh tonsoni let everybody know where they can find you and all of your great work yeah uh if you're delphi bracketology uh go to delphi bracketology.com or on twitter at delphi brackets if you have any questions uh, let us know uh, we'll try to, to try to respond uh the purdue people have been very good to delphi bracketology and our students uh with stuff at purdue um, and we have some, we have two members. I'm going for assembly call tomorrow night and we have two members of Delphi Bracketology are making the trip down for media. So thank you to Indiana uh, for doing that as well. A student and a, another teacher will be making the trip. Uh, so Delphi Bracketology there for me personally, it's at Sony 42. Uh, I don't know if you like, uh, you don't want to follow an Indiana guy. So, but if you're interested in a basketball guy or whatever, uh, at Sony 42, uh, for that and uh, assembly call again if you want to tune in every once in a while especially if we lose it's always kind of a, a riot uh, I guess uh, if you want to do that but uh, I do want to say and, and I'll be done thank you for for asking Craig and, and Joe Ark when, I, when we get to talk at the the Purdue games uh, you guys do a really good job the Big Ten is great basketball and, and even though Indiana's going to win tomorrow night uh I wish you guys nothing but the best on your show. And if you ever need anything, brackets, talk, or anything, please, please uh, let us know. Uh, you guys are, are good people, and, and it's a hell of a lot better, oh, sorry, than being with Braggs. So yeah. anytime you two <laughs> want me on and Braggs isn't here, sign me up. There we go. You're right. You're able to make some words in this time with, with Bragg's not here. Um, but yeah, no, we really do appreciate you coming on. And even though you're not you guy, like just giving a lot of information and knowledge and uh, for anybody that does want to follow him and is skeptical because he is not you dude, if you want to just know more about basketball, that's a reason to follow him. And then, like I said, the Delphi Bracketology stuff, they're one of, for me, one of the main kind of Bracketology sources I use just to kind of keep track of that. Cause that's not something I personally um, like keep track of on a day-to-day -day basis. So we appreciate everybody tuning in. We will be live right after the game with it being at Indiana. We'll be live, you know, five-ish minutes after the game, after the final buzzer, win or lose. Definitely come check us out. Um, you can follow Craig on Twitter at Craig Bowers34, me on Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB. And you can follow us on Twitter at Boilers in Stands, where we will give live in-game updates. Once again, we will be here live right after the game tomorrow. And so we appreciate everybody tuning in, and we will catch you tomorrow after Purdue takes on Indiana at Assembly Hall, 7 o'clock.